Well, if you will, uh, keep your bulletins open uh, to those Bible readings there. If you have a Bible with you, open in your Bibles uh, to uh, this reading from Acts chapter 28 in particular, though uh, note that Romans 1 reading that's there. It's helpful and relevant for us today. Um, what I want you to do, especially if you have a Bible with you this morning, uh, is either maybe look across the page or flip the page, and I want you to see what comes after this Bible reading from Acts chapter 28 today. It's not Acts. It's Romans, which means we are uh, nearly at the end of this 10-month long study that we've been doing in the book of Acts, which is wonderful news in some ways. Um, we're going to take two weeks to look at this final chapter. Next week, we're just going to look at two verses, actually, which is kind of a change for us. We've been looking at some long passages. But next week, uh, just two verses that we're going to look at. We'll kind of do a summary of the whole series. But this morning, we're going to focus on verses uh, 11 through 28. Now, if you've been uh, faithfully following along in this study, uh, there's one short sentence in this passage before us today that should really grab your attention and maybe even fill you with a sense of accomplishment. Uh, you know which sentence it is that I'm referring to. It's there at the end of verse 14. And so we came to Rome. Uh, I, love, I love the way that Luke writes sometimes. He's kind of the master of, of understatement. He, there's no frills, there's no dramatic pauses, just very simply, but very definitively and critically. And so we came to Rome. And of course, it's such a critical statement because it's been this arrival in Rome that we've been looking forward to, that we've been longing for. And again, if you've been faithfully following along in this 10-month uh, study, one of the things that's so great about this book is that it's, it's, it's just constantly on the move. I mean, the book of Acts has taken us on this, this journey, and not just a, a metaphorical journey, but it's taken us on a literal geographical journey. The book of Acts begins in Jerusalem, and here now it ends in Rome, and in between we've, we've visited dozens and, and dozens of cities. And all of this, of course, was mapped out at the very beginning by Jesus in that one verse we've come back to time and again. You remember it, I'm sure. After Jesus' death and resurrection, after 40 days of uh, him then teaching the disciples, preparing them for ministry, and then just before he ascended into heaven, Jesus said to them, Acts chapter 1, verse 8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses beginning in Jerusalem and through all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And so as we come here to, to Rome today, this is in some ways the gospel under the authority of an apostle being brought to the end of the earth, the very, the very epicenter of the world in that day, which isn't to say that uh, the gospel hadn't reached Rome previously. It clearly had. We see a, a Christian community that uh, is there in Rome already. Uh, nor is this to say that this is the end, the end. It's very clearly not, as we'll see next week. Uh, this arrival in Rome is really just the beginning of, of gospel mission throughout the whole world. But there is a very important truth here that we now have moved all the way from Jerusalem in Acts chapter 1 to Rome here in Acts chapter 28. This is the long journey that we've been on through the book of Acts. Uh, I find this to be a, um, a very interesting and exciting time of year in our, our culture uh, because it's, 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 a, it's a time, of course, when uh, uh, schools are finishing up and there are lots of uh, graduation ceremonies to attend. Uh, there's uh, something exciting about these ceremonies. I love getting those announcements in, in the mail from uh, friends who have children graduating, announcing that they're finishing up high school. And, uh, and it's an exciting time. Is, a whole new generation is prepared to embark upon the world and, and to embark upon this new journey that's, that's ahead of them. But it's always very interesting to listen to the, some of those uh, commencement addresses. Uh, it seems like there's like a, a playbook that you, everybody has that they got to choose some stock phrases in order to give these commencement addresses. You know, the phrases like, uh, you, you can accomplish all of your dreams. The, the sky's the, the limit. Uh, we're going to be the generation who, who changes the world. Uh, be who you are, never change. Which seems like terrible advice for an 18-year-old. Never change. Uh, but the problem, of course, with all these stock phrases is that not only are they unhelpfully idealistic, but also, at least from a Christian perspective, they're just, they're just very human-centered. It's, it's, it's your dreams. It's what you're going to make of life. Whereas for the Christian, you see, that we want to think about how we move through life with God. 
uh, where God is the central figure, where God is the determining uh, the course for us, where everything is, is built around Him. That's the kind of journey that as Christians that we want to go on. And so as we come to this final chapter in the book of Acts, uh, as this journey in Acts starts to come to an end, uh, I think there's some helpful themes that we've seen throughout the book of Acts already, but that Luke now reminds us of once again that can be of help to us as we consider the nature of our own journeys, as it were. So I want to identify um, three of those themes for you this morning. And, and friends, my hope in doing so is that as we consider the course of our own lives, that we would be more and more encouraged by the way that God is at work both in our lives and in this world, providentially ordering all things. So three things. And one of the, the, the important things we see here in this, this chapter is that, that sense of fulfillment that I've already alluded to. Uh, with Paul's arrival in Rome, what we see here is that God now has uh, fulfilled his initial plans for Paul and, and for the gospel. And I think one of the very interesting and revealing things for us to note is how it is that God gets his people to where he wants them to be. Um, what we have to remember uh, is that it was both God's will and it was Paul's desire to go to Rome. It seemed like a great situation. God said, go to Rome. Paul said, I want to go to Rome. This was God's will. Uh, we see this all the way back in chapter 19, verse 21, where uh, Paul expressed the fact that he, he must see Rome. Uh, and then you remember that God comes to Paul while he's on trial in, in Jerusalem. And, and God says to him in chapter 23, verse 11, Take courage, for as you have testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem, so you must testify also in Rome. Uh, and then again, just last week, in the, in the middle of the storm, where uh, all hope seems to be lost, an angel of God appears to Paul and tells him to not be afraid. You're not going to die. Why? Because, says the angel, you, you must stand before Caesar. Hey, this was God's will. And yet, it's, it's been kind of a wild journey, hasn't it? I mean, if you look at verse 11 of our passage today, it reminds us of, of where we are in the story. Uh, that Paul, for the last three months, he's, he's been stranded on the island of Malta. And the reason he was stranded on the island of Malta was because he just barely survived a, a violent storm at sea, which destroyed the ship that he was sailing on. And then before that, Paul uh, uh, had been going through trial after trial. His life had been uh, plotted against. He, he had sat in, in a prison cell in Caesarea for two years because some Roman politician couldn't make up their mind of, of what to do with him. And so people are trying to kill him. Uh, he's sitting in prison, and then he gets on a ship, and a journey that should take five weeks takes four months. And yet, nonetheless, here he's in Rome, just as God said he must be. And friends, the point is that God can and does use a variety of means to fulfill his plans to get his people where he wants them to be. Right? I mean, in Paul's case, he used, think of all the things he used. he used. He used the fact that Paul was a Roman citizen. He used some specific Roman policies. He used secular government officials. He used unrighteous Jewish uh, religious leaders. He used the help of friends. He used weather conditions. He used good circumstances. He used bad circumstances. And all of it he brought together to accomplish his will. So the lesson is don't, uh, don't think you're out of the will of God just because some things seem to be surprising or challenging. No, God's always at work, you see. It's just that he doesn't work the same way with, with all of us. Now, for some, the journey seems to, be, seems to be relatively easy. For others, the journey is particularly hard, it seems. Uh, but God is God's still at work. And so what we have to do is we have to have our eyes open to, to that fact and to see what it is that God might be doing through whatever the circumstances are that we're in. I mean, isn't that one of the things that Paul so wonderfully teaches us all along the way of his journey? In all these circumstances that Paul faced, though, though they were challenging and pleasant many times, he saw all of them as opportunities to point people to Jesus. Do we do that? I want to do that more in my life. I want us as a church to do that more in our life. Do, do we see the, the circumstances of our lives as, as gospel opportunities? You know, consider, when was the last time that you were delayed? Maybe, maybe your subway got delayed. Maybe your plane got delayed. And did you, did you, did you see that delay as an opportunity for the gospel? 
or as an opportunity to unload at the person behind the counter, right? Why do we see these opportunities that God has given us? Uh, to exhibit love, to exhibit patience, to point people to Jesus Christ. Do we understand that? Do we understand that in one sense, no matter what comes at us, we're never out of the will of God. Right? Biblically, we're never out of the will of God. Uh, sometimes Christians think, uh, you know, they have this idea, well, you know, I, I made this decision and I, I ended up moving to this place and I took this job and it's just been really hard and doors seem to be closing all the time and I, I don't really understand and, and I, I, I must be out of God's will. I must be living, this is sometimes how Christians use language, I must be living plan B. That plan B for, for God's will of my life. I've missed it. But you understand, biblically, that's not true. Now, we can make moral decisions that are against the will of God, but we're never out of the will of God. Right, wherever we're living, whatever job we have, the person we're married to, we're not out of the will of God. God has us where he will have us, and he will get us to where he wants us to be. Do we understand that? Do we, do we understand that God will use a variety of means to get us there? Uh, God's in charge. And he's pretty good at it. Uh, that's why if you look at verse 11, uh, we're told in verse 11, after three months we set sail in a ship that had wintered in, in the island, that's the island of Malta, a ship of Alexandria with the twin gods as a figurehead. Uh, the, the twin gods that are mentioned there are the Greek gods Castor and, and Pollux who are said to be sons of, of Zeus. And so there's wood carvings of them on the front of this new ship that Paul's sailing on from, from Malta to Italy. And many commentators look at that little detail and uh, I think rightly conclude that Luke is being a, a bit ironic in, in mentioning this because what, what, the, what the Greeks believed is that Castor and Pollux were protectors of, of good fortune for those traveling at sea. They were, they were seen sort of as, as good luck charms to have on the ship. Uh, but of course, if you were, you were here with us last week, then you, you understand why that's so humorous. Right? Because, because God's the one who, according to his word, delivered Paul. God is the, the creator of the wind and the waves and the sea and, and everything in this world. And so as we move through life, the, the Christian doesn't do luck or, or, or random chance or, or superstition. Rather, we, we, we journey through life trusting the Lord God, the creator of the world, who's sovereignly ordering all things to accomplish his will. It was God's will for Paul to get to Rome. That's, that's why he's in Rome. And then what's further interesting as we consider this theme of fulfillment is that it, it wasn't just God's will for Paul to arrive in Rome, but actually it was Paul's own great desire to get to Rome. This is, this is what Paul himself wanted. This was Paul's great prayer that God would bring him to Rome one day. That's what Paul wrote to the church in Rome in that uh, reading there from Romans chapter 1. Uh, Romans 1 was written a few years prior to Paul's arrival uh, uh, in Acts 28 here. Uh, Paul arrived in Rome in about 60 AD, and Romans was probably written in about 57 AD. But this is what Paul wrote to the Romans in, in verse 9 of Romans 1. He said, For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I mention you always in my prayers and what is he praying for asking that somehow by God's will I may now at last succeed in coming to you I don't know how you read that but I kind of read that as Paul he sort of comes across there as a as a child with his father pleading with him because every time he prays without ceasing God please let me go to Rome Please, God, let me go to Rome, please. And if he was my child, he'd say something like, you never let me go to Rome. It's not fair. Let me go to Rome, God. God, somehow, he says, somehow, by your will, get me there. Now, let me ask you, uh, do you think when Paul prayed and asked that God would somehow get him to Rome, that he conceived that it might actually be in this way uh, and be as, as, as a prisoner in chains because that's how God answered his prayer. And for all that Paul went through, this tumultuous ordeal that we've seen in chapters 21 through 27, when he does finally arrive in Rome, he arrives as a prisoner in chains. Do you, you think he expected that? It's not exactly a glorious entrance. 
And of course, the lesson for us is to recognize that, that, that the way that God answers our prayers may not always be the way that we expect Him to uh, or even desire Him to. But friends, again, the point is that God can and does use a variety of means to fulfill His plans and get His people where He wants them to be. But we trust Him with that. I think there's something humble about the way that Paul prays this. God, God somehow, I, I leave it to your will, God, somehow get me there. Do we trust God? Will we take advantage of the opportunities along the way that he has providentially ordered for us as he works out his plans? That's the first thing. Uh, the second theme we see here uh, that I hope will be of help to us as we travel through this life uh, is the theme of, of family. And, and friendship, or, or what we often call Christian fellowship. Uh, as Luke uh, details the, the final leg of Paul's trip to Rome, he tells us in verse 13 that they uh, put in at Syracuse, and then after that they went to Rochester and Buffalo and, and Albany. <laughs> They're not that far off course. Uh, Syracuse and Sicily, think of that ball-looking island, the, the toe shape of, of Italy. Uh, from Syracuse they go to Regium, and then they uh, finally arrive and depart the ship for good at Puteoli. I think is how you say that, Puteoli, sounds very Italian. Uh, look at uh, verse 14 then. Uh, there we found brothers and were invited to stay with them for seven days, and so we came to Rome. And the brothers there, when they heard about us, came as far as the Forum of Appius and three taverns to meet us. On seeing them, Paul thanked God and took courage. Uh, Luke gives us these uh, wonderful little details here as Paul uh, lands in Italy <clears throat> that uh, both outside of Rome and as he arrives in Rome that he's uh, welcomed and shown hospitality by these Christian brothers and sisters who have traveled uh, a fair distance to come and, and to welcome him. Uh, there had already been a number of churches established in Rome and, and in its surroundings and, and, and this is what things are like. Uh, with the family of God. If you've ever had that experience, we travel to a new place and uh, you meet someone who's a Christian, maybe, maybe you don't know them very well, maybe you don't know them at all, and, and yet you automatically have this certain kind of depth of relationship with them. Uh, there's, there's, there's a bond there that, that, that's just automatically there because you, you have a shared identity in Jesus Christ. You've both been bought with the, the very blood of Jesus. I mean, it's a joy to, to even just read something like this. This kind of Christian love is a joy to behold because what these brothers and sisters in Christ are doing for Paul is both an act of practical love as well uh, as an affirmation of what he means to them. I mean, imagine Paul, no doubt, at this point is physically and emotionally exhausted. And here they are to care for him and to, and to welcome him. And again, this is who we are as the family of God. This is what we do. It re uh, reminds me of what Jesus says in Mark 10. Uh, Peter and the disciples say to Jesus, uh, I think in a rather petulant manner, that, Jesus, we left everything to follow you, Jesus. And then Jesus reminds Peter, and he says, truly I say to you, there is no one who has left houses or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands. But did you hear what Jesus is saying there? Right? What he's saying is that even now in this life, if you, if you come and you follow me, you, you, you gain family. You may, you, you may have left a lot to come and follow me, says Jesus. Maybe there was family who rejected you when you came to follow me. But you actually gain more relationships when you come. You don't have children. These are your children. Maybe your mother and father were out of the picture. Here, you have a mother and a father. Maybe your grandparents have passed away long ago. Here, in the family of God, you have grandparents. We gain relationships. We come and follow Jesus. We're united to him here in the church. What a, what a wonderful promise this is that Jesus gives us. And that's what Paul's experiencing here. In fact, it's very interesting, actually, as these, as these Christians rally around him, it's almost a, a paradoxical, triumphant welcome of sorts for him as he enters Rome, even though he's in chains. Uh, they welcome him. They, they show him love. Friends, do, do, we, do we see this as part of God's kindness to us in this life? 
Uh, taking up our cross and following Jesus isn't always easy. There are an untold number of hardships as we journey through life, and yet God has given us each other to help each other along the way. And that's what these brothers and sisters do for Paul. Uh, notice Paul's response as they come to meet him. He thanked God and took courage. It's remarkable, really. Uh, I think we often think of, of Paul, the, the great apostle, uh, traveling around and, and strengthening the church. But what we see here is Paul being strengthened by the church. Right? It's, it, it's mutual, you see. Uh, those in ministry, whether they be pastors or, or church leaders or ministers of other sorts, uh, yes, uh, as, as the Lord calls them to, they pour themselves out for the church, but the, there's also mutual encouragement uh, because we're all part of this family together as brothers and sisters, and each of us, no matter who we are, needs to be encouraged and strengthened along the way. And so, friends, if you, if you keep yourself aloof from the Christian community, if you say, I, I don't really want people to know me and I'm not really interested in getting to know others, uh, understand that you're ultimately missing out on one of God's kindnesses uh, to us that he's given us to help us along the way. Right? This family, this friendship that we have together in Christ as the church. So here in Acts 28, we're given strength for the journey by being reminded that God's always working through a variety of means to fulfill his plan. That he provides church family and uh, Christian friendship along the way for encouragement. And then thirdly, we're reminded that the Word of God can never be fettered. And what I mean by that is that in this, this uh, long final section of this passage, verses 17 through 28, uh, though Paul's hindered now in his own movements being under house arrest, and he himself is uh, in chains, as he says there in uh, verse 20, it is because of the hope of Israel that I am wearing this chain. So Paul is in chains. Uh, but what we see here is that the word of God, though, is not chained. The gospel continues to be preached and, and proclaimed and will continue to go out, even from Rome. And, and that's what we see develop here in this final section of our passage. After Paul has uh, three days to rest and enjoy the fellowship of the church and probably to prepare himself for his a trial before Caesar. We're told in verse 17 that he then calls together uh, the local leaders of the Jews. Uh, historians note that uh, Rome had a large uh, Jewish population at this time, estimated to be anywhere between 20 and 50,000, and so uh, Paul wants to meet with these leaders. Um, partly it seems to set the record straight uh, of why he's in chains, that he's not some sort of insurrectionist who might destabilize the, the current relationship between the Jewish people and, uh, and the Roman government. Uh, but nor is he a threat to the Jewish people. In fact, his point is that he, he, he's in chains precisely because of the hope of Israel. Uh, that is, he's, he's in chains because he's fully committed to the hope of the Messiah and, and the resurrection life that the Messiah brings. And so he, he, he wants what's best for Israel, and he makes that point to them. I suspect he would have been surprised that they hadn't yet received letters from Jerusalem denouncing him. Uh, they have, however, heard plenty about Christianity uh, which notice in verse 22 was uh, regarded, as a, regarded as a Jewish sect. That's how Christianity was seen. It was seen as a, a sect of Judaism, which in some ways is right. I mean, it wasn't intended to be a new religion. It intended to be the fulfillment of the Jewish religion. And so they, these Jewish leaders, they want to hear more about it from him, which Paul seems very happy to oblige. Again, he takes advantage of every opportunity. And so we pick up in, in verse 23. Look at verse 23. When they had appointed a day for him, they came to him at his lodging in greater numbers. From morning till evening, he expounded to them, testifying to the kingdom of God and trying to convince them about Jesus, both from the law of Moses and from the prophets. And some were convinced by what he said, but others disbelieved. And disagreeing among themselves, they departed after Paul had made one statement. The Holy Spirit was right in saying to your fathers through Isaiah the prophet, Go to this people and say, You will indeed hear, but never understand. And you will indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes they have closed, 
lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and turn and I would heal them. Therefore, let it be known to you that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They will listen. Uh, In many ways, this is a, a replay of what we've seen so often through the book of Acts. We've seen Paul repeatedly sharing the gospel with Uh, The Jewish people, he goes into a city, and the first people that he goes to are the Jewish people. Uh, And then, uh, I mean, this is a sermon as well that he's he's given probably hundreds of times. He knows the sermon by heart, and he's he's doing what he's always been doing. He's he's expounding, and he's he's, he's testifying, and he's trying to convince them about the the truth of Jesus. He's talking to them about the the kingdom of God and and Jesus the King and and how Jesus is, is on all the pages of the Old Testament. That Jesus is there in the the law of Moses, those those first five books of the Old Testament. That Jesus is there in the the prophets, by which he means not just the the major and the minor prophets, as we sometimes refer to them, but the the historical books of the Old Testament as well. That's how the historical books were uh, traditionally categorized. They were understood to be prophetic writings. And he's saying, Jesus is there. And surely he, he once again pointed them to passages that we've seen repeatedly here in Acts. Passages, perhaps, like that of Exodus 12, where we read about the Passover and how the the offering of blood saved people from death and how Jesus is the fulfillment of that. Jesus is the Passover lamb. Or Isaiah 53 and the description of how God's servant would be wounded for our transgressions and and crushed for our iniquities. Or perhaps the Psalm 16 and and the wonderful promise that God would not abandon his holy one to the grave. Speaking of the resurrection, or to Psalm 2, which speaks of the Messiah as the Son of God, the one to whom all the nations will be given as an inheritance. And surely he would have pointed them to the fundamental Old Testament promise that the the Messiah, Jesus, would be the one and only Savior for this world. That there'd be no other means for all people throughout the world, Jew or Gentile, to enter God's kingdom apart from Jesus. Just as the prophets tell us, I will make you as a light for the nations that my salvation may reach the end of the earth. This is a sermon that Paul has preached many times. And every time he preaches it, it's to, to convince people of who Jesus is and of what he's done for us in his his righteous life and his substitutionary death and his victorious resurrection and that we must respond to him with repentance and faith. And of course, we've also seen this kind of divided response time and again uh, where some, some people believe, but many don't. And I suppose that maybe one of the differences here is that Paul offers a very dire warning at the end. Uh, he quotes the prophet Isaiah from Isaiah chapter 6. And notice, uh, just in passing, that it was the Holy Spirit who spoke through Isaiah, just as the Holy Spirit does with all the scriptures written by Isaiah, but it's the Holy Spirit writing through the prophet, giving us the very word of God. But Paul quotes Isaiah as his, as his parting shot to them, and he says, do, do you see how the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled in you? You hear, but you you don't really hear. You don't really listen or understand. You you see, but you don't really see. And your your heart has grown dull. And you may think, well, why did Paul say that? Did he have to be so abrasive with this parting shot? Couldn't he just let things go? Do you know that these verses are quoted in each of the four Gospels? Quoted even by Jesus himself and and used in this very way. Paul here is just doing what Jesus did with this passage. I mean, these are some of the most important verses from the Old Testament because they actually serve as a warning to us as well. You know, that we can sit and we can hear sermon after sermon and we can hear Bible reading after Bible reading and yet never really listen, never really see never really feel the glory of God in Jesus Christ. And there's something even more dire in this warning. In fact, the more we sit and the more we listen and, 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 and not really listen, just, just hear the words, the more our hearts actually get hard, the duller we become. 
when we don't receive the Word of God with humility and faith. But in fact, the reason why Luke ends the book of Acts this way is to make the point that not even the rejection of the gospel by those who oppose the gospel can chain the gospel. It will continue to go out. And so verse 28 points us to this uh, further future mission. In fact, we're going to come back to this theme in uh, detail next week. But what we need to hear today in order to take encouragement for this journey we're on is that nothing can hinder the advance of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Not even our own limitations can hinder it. That Paul's chains could not hinder the spread of the gospel. And this is what Paul says explicitly when he writes to Timothy. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, he says, Though I'm bound with chains as a criminal, though, though I'm limited and bound, the Word of God is not bound, he says to Timothy. The Word of God is powerful. The Word of God keeps going out. There are no earthly chains that can bind the Word of God. Well, friends, you know, if we were to uh, take the time to go around the room here today. Uh, I'm certain we would find that we, we're all at different places in our lives. Uh, some of us are looking towards the future and uh, it seems exciting. A lot of things that we're anticipating and, and, and we're filling us with joy, but some of us are looking to the future and we're filled with anxiety and we're filled with fear and some of us are walking through some very challenging sorrowful times. But if God's at the center of this journey, you see, then no matter the situation we're in, we can take encouragement that God has a variety of ways to fulfill His plans for us. And then He's given us a, a Christian family, a community like no other to share in. And that no matter our circumstances, the Word of God is never fettered. It's, it's never bound. We always have the opportunity to point people to Jesus. Many of you will know the story of uh, Joni Erickson Tata. Uh, I'm not sure I've ever mentioned her in a sermon to you before, but her story uh, is well known. Uh, as a young woman, her life was forever changed in 1967 at the age of 17 when she dove into the Chesapeake Bay and fractured her spine. And, and has for the last 50 years, it's, it's 50 years this year since that happened to her. For the last 50 years, she's been a quadriplegic. Uh, she's been paralyzed from her shoulders down. And, and, and what's been amazing, if you know the story, is how the Lord has used her to point people to Him. And how she's faithfully and joyfully done that. Uh, Ten years ago, uh, Joni wrote this. She said, few of us have the luxury... It took me forever to think of it as that. To come to ground zero with God. Before the accident, my questions had always been, how will God fit into this situation? How will He affect my dating life, my career plans, the things I enjoy? All those options were gone. It was me, just a helpless body and God. I had no other identity but God. And gradually, he became enough. I became overwhelmed with the phenomenon of the personal God who created the universe living in my life. He would make me attractive and worthwhile. Maybe God's gift to me is my dependence on him. I will never reach the place where I am self-sufficient, where God is crowded out of my life. I am aware of his grace to me every moment. My need for help is obvious every day when I wake up flat on my back waiting for someone to come dress me. I cannot even comb my hair or blow my nose alone. And there's one more thing. I have hope for the future. The Bible speaks of our bodies being glorified in heaven. In high school, that was always a hazy, foreign concept, being glorified. But now I realize that I will be healed I have not been cheated out of being a complete person. I am just going through a 40-year delay. And God is with me even through that. Being glorified 
I know the meaning of that now. It's the time after my death here when I will be on my feet dancing. Friends, what have we done with our limitations? As we move through this life, is, is God at the center? Or do we just try to squeeze him in where it's convenient? Do we find encouragement here where we're supposed to find it? Trusting that God has a variety of ways to get us where he wants us to be. That in his kindness, he's given us this church family for the journey. And that even if we're severely limited, his word never is. And in fact, it's often through our limitations, our struggles, our weaknesses, that God most powerfully works. And so we came to Rome. Luke very simply says, but what a word of encouragement that is. Let's pray. Uh, Father, there is no doubt that we are all in different places here this morning. And yet the one truth, the one reality is that you are the sovereign God. You know all things. And for those who put their faith in Jesus, that you are right there in the center of our lives with us. Oh, Father, build our faith. Help us to trust you and your word that we might move through this life bringing honor to you, finding joy and hope and being a blessing to others. Please do this for your glory, we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen.